Hi, I'm Caroline Ball, and I'm a general cardiologist at Loyola University Medical Center. I'm excited to talk with you today about cardiac amyloidosis. So cardiac amyloidosis is a cardiomyopathy that is largely due to amyloid deposition in all areas of the heart. The amyloid can deposit in the ventricles, in the atria, in the perivasculature, the valves, and the conduction system. It generally presents as a restrictive or infiltrative subtype of cardiomyopathy. When I think about cardiac amyloidosis, there are really three main types that are separated into two distinct groups. The first is light chain amyloidosis, also called AL amyloidosis. This is a rare, systemic, and rapidly progressive disease. The second major type of cardiac amyloidosis is transthyretin, which is a naturally occurring protein that can um, dissociate and deposit within the myocardium. There are two primary forms of transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. The first is hereditary, also called mutant type. The second is what we refer to as wild type ATTR. And this is really more a disease of the elderly. It's frequently referred to as senile systemic amyloidosis. Let's begin by talking about AL amyloid. So we know that 50 to 70% of patients with systemic AL amyloidosis will develop some sort of cardiac involvement. In fact, disease prognosis can largely be determined by the degree of cardiac involvement. And patients who are diagnosed with AL amyloid need workup to identify if they do have a degree of cardiac involvement. ATTR amyloid frequently presents with systemic symptoms, although they're not always identified by clinicians. We know that patients who have ATTR amyloid frequently have bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. They frequently have lumbar spinal stenosis or bicep tendon rupture. ATTR mutant type is again a genetic condition that is seen with increased frequency in certain ethnic populations. Certain genes have been identified, which can be tested for in patients who have been identified as having ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. ATTR wild type or senile cardiac amyloidosis may be responsible for up to 30% of HFPEF patients over age 75. And there are autopsy studies that show that ATTR wild type is seen in 20% of octogenarians with any heart failure. When I think about suspecting cardiac amyloidosis, it comes down to two different conditions. One is patients who I know have an underlying AL um, amyloidosis. The other are patients who present with HFPEF who may have amyloidosis as the etiology. As an echocardiographer, when I come across an echo that looks like this image, my suspicion is raised for ATTR amyloidosis. Some of the specific findings on this echo include the increased LV wall thickness, as well as the small pericardial effusion. In addition, patients with cardiac amyloidosis may have thickening of the atrioventricular valves, of the inner atrial septum, or of the right ventricular free wall, as cardiac amyloidosis can also affect the right ventricle. In our echo lab, we use strain imaging to further help us identify patients who may have amyloid. Strain imaging allows us to look at deformation of the myocardium. Classically, patients with cardiac amyloidosis will have preservation of the apex. As seen in this image, it's classically described as a cherry on top. This dark red area on the strain imaging suggests apical preservation of strain. EKG can also be used to help support a diagnosis of amyloidosis. The classic finding is a low voltage EKG despite known left ventricular hypertrophy. However, this is not particularly sensitive in screening for amyloid. Up to 70% of patients with amyloid will indeed have a pseudo infarct pattern on their ECG. We also know that a certain population of the aortic stenosis population, including patients who are undergoing TAVR, have cardiac amyloid and emerging research is helping us quantify this population. My method for screening for cardiac amyloidosis comes down to pretest probability and the patient themselves. In a patient with known AL amyloid, I often get a cardiac MRI to look for cardiac involvement. In a patient who presents with HFPEF, I start with an echo and an ECG. 
in those patients in whom I have increased suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis, I then get serum and urine protein electrophoresis with immunofixation, as well as serum light chains to look for AL amyloid. I also get a PYP scan to look for ATTR amyloid, and by using those two screening methods together, can make sure that I'm looking for all types of cardiac amyloid.